Uh, all right, grab a Bible. <clears throat> We're going to jump in the Word today. And uh, I, um, I'm going to get this where I don't rock it and flip it on the floor. That'll be fun. Um, I say this every week, and I will say it every week. Sometimes we're going to have the words on the screen or the verses on the screen. Sometimes we'll have all of them. Sometimes we'll have some of them. That's not a game that I'm trying to play with you. That's an encouragement to get you to take a Bible into your hand or in your phone if you want. I'm a fan of holding it, but if you don't, that's okay. As long as you have access to your own Bible, because ultimately this is just me talking. Uh, when you walk out of here, I don't want you saying, oh, you know, that pastor said. I'd rather you say, man, back in that first book of the Bible, it says... So there's Bibles all over the place back there on that uh, table. Get one, take one. If you took one last week, take another one this week. It's okay. We have tons of them. I will always have Bibles. Don't worry. We have boxes of them when those run out. There's different kinds. Some people are like, well, I don't know if I should take the hardback one. Take the hardback one. There's Bibles, okay? So take them. Uh, And there's Spanish as well if you want that or prefer that. So anyway. Need to have a Bible. Also, there's sheets back there you can take notes on if you want to do that, if you don't type them or whatever. You know, something we were talking about this week, notes are ultimately not for you. Notes are for the people that you're going to tell. So something God points out in his word, you know, the notes are good. Some people think, well, if I write notes, I, I pay attention better. That's fine. But ultimately, the notes should be for you. Like, I've got something I want somebody else to know. Uh, so take, take notes so you can pass it on. Not Don't care about what creative thing I say. I'm just talking about it in his word. So go to first book, Genesis chapter four. Again, your Bible is not a uh, re, you know, a narrative. It's a library. So in the Bible, there's all these different books that are categorized just like a library would. So if you walked into a library and you started the far left shelf and you start going to the right, you're going to be lost. So it's not the way it exactly works, the Bible, but there is a storyline uh, it's not the story of Adam, it's not the story of Abraham, it's not the story of Moses, it's, it's the story of God. And so we're following that over the months ahead, and we're going to work through the Bible chronologically. So we might skip around at some point. For a while, it's going to go pretty smooth, but we might start skipping around a little. But right now, fortunately for you, we're in the first book, so really easy to find. Uh, right on the fourth chapter is where we're at. So if you follow the story really quick so far... Talked about the God who was before creation. Talked about the Trinity and that, that whole thing a few weeks back and what God looked like before creation. We talked about the God who created all things and his act of creating and how he uh, developed this perfect place for his own image to be placed in, which was Adam or Adam and Eve. And how he created mankind, put them there on the sixth day. How uh, Satan, in the form of a serpent or dragon, deceived them and led them by their own desire to rule, to rebel against God, bringing a fall and sin into the world. And to this day, we live in that same sinful fallen world. So we've talked about that all the way up. So the good news is at the same time that the fall happened in Genesis chapter three, God promised Eve that a seed from her body would be a victor, a conqueror over the seed of the serpent or Satan. And it's that seed, uh, child, offspring, I prefer the word seed, but it's that seed that we're going to follow throughout all of Scripture. So it's that promised seed that we're going to look for. That's important because right from the start, that's where we land the plane. So this week, we're calling it the monster at the door, and you're going to see why here in a second. But go to Genesis chapter 4. We're in verse 8. Let me read verse 8. We're going to cover a lot here, as we always do, but let me read uh, verse 8. And, and a couple here. It says, Cain, and Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. So these are the first children of Adam and Eve, or children of Adam and Eve. Cain spoke to his brother uh, Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So let me pray. Lord, Your word is awesome, and I pray again, as I do frequently, Lord, that I'm a student. I have the privilege of holding a microphone and standing on this stage, but I'm not claiming to be the teacher. You're the teacher. I pray you teach me even as my mouth is open. I pray that your word is spoken through me, 
and that people are drawn to what your word says and not to what my mouth says. And I pray, God, that um, you're glorified by what's discussed because it comes from you. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So if you know anything about the fighting world, I started to use Josh as an example last minute because he, he competed yesterday in, in MMA contest. But uh, if you know anything about the fighting world, whether it's UFC or boxing or whatever it is, there's an element of the game that is really important, although it doesn't seem like it. It seems like it's all show, but it's called trash talk. So, and if you know anything about what that looks like, probably the master of all time at trash talk was Ali. So, a couple of key lines from Ali. He's too ugly to be the world champion. The world champ should be pretty like me, you know. Or I'll beat him so bad, he'll need a shoehorn to put his hat on. Uh, another one was... Uh, you box? What you box? Apples or oranges? I love that one, man. That one's good. Uh, so anyway, I'm not speaking to his character whatsoever, okay? So don't go there. I'm just saying he, he, he do all this. So is it just bragging? Like that's the way it comes across. Like he's just bragging. Like he's just super arrogant, which he probably was. Well, I'm sure he was. But, but it was more than that. Like it was, there was a lot more to what he was doing than just that because obviously in a fight you're trying to beat up the other fighter, but a good fighter can endure pain. Lots of it. So a lot of the fight is not about trying to just beat up the other person. It's to try to get inside the other person's head and frustrate them so that they lose control or do something stupid and surrender themselves without realizing it. They mess up. They just blow up, and they get out of their game plan, and before you know it, they've they messed up, and they've uh, given you the game, so to speak, or given you the fight. So today, Adam and Eve's legacy begins, we're jumping in this, with the first recorded death in history. Recorded death. Now imagine Adam and Eve's first understanding of the death that they accepted when they ate that fruit is through the death of their child. It's not one of them first. It's a child is the first. In fact, it's two children because one murders the other one. And in essence, they lose both kids. Anger here is allowed to reach like these extremes. So, so the question we got to ask as we go through this is, are we capable of this? You know, are we capable of, of reaching this place of extreme Release, and, I, and I'm not just saying it's easy to really quick say, no, 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 I'd never murder anybody. And maybe you wouldn't. But can you get angry enough to lose control completely? Some of you may have been there before, you know. I may, may get pushed to a point where, hey, and then the quick answer is I just can't help myself. I just can't help myself. Is that true? Is that really true? Uh, so if you've got a sheet, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay. But the, I always put kind of a main point on there. So if you take anything out of here, keep this in your head. We need to keep our hearts seeking God because sin is anxious for us to give in. And if we do, it's always worse than we thought it would be for ourselves and for others. Okay? If we do, it's always worse than we thought it would be for ourselves and for others. So look at uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Back up a little bit. It says, Now Adam Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, so let me pause there just a minute. In the course of time, okay? So that tells you there is a a period of time passing. So don't assume that these two boys, if you know this story, I may unplug some things for you, and that's okay. But if you don't assume that these two boys were just little boys, uh, not the case. And don't assume that Adam and Eve only had these two and then stopped. That's not the case either. We know it's not the case. Uh, many scholars, I won't say all, but many scholars like to argue that these two boy, boys were probably around 100 years old when this happened. So th- these are not little bitty teenage boys making this moment occur. And Eve says she's gotten a man at his birth, though, she says she's gotten a man, which means to buy or to purchase. Like, she's saying that she has gained, bought, purchased a man. Cain's name means to acquire or purchase. Abel's name, interestingly enough, means vanity or like fading away. She named him. 
What does that tell you about what she's thinking between the two boys? You know, Cain is, I've gained a man, I've purchased a man, and number two is fading away. You know, I think maybe Eve's endured this pain of childbirth that she was going to be cursed with, and with God's help, she's earned her Savior. That's what I think. Because she says, you know, there was a seed promised, and this is him, Cain, right? The seed has arrived. And all hope is on him. So Abel, hey, that's a bonus. You know, he's passing away. He's a bonus. But all hope is on, on Cain. He's the firstborn. He's the seed. He's the one that's fulfilled it. And, hey, look, I earned this thing with God's help. Verse 3, she, or it goes on. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard, that means like gazed at or turned his eyes towards Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard or didn't gaze or turn his eyes towards. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Some say uh, Adam built the first altar. Now, there's nowhere in the scripture that literally says that necessarily, but there's a, a belief, especially among uh, Hebrew texts, that Adam built the first altar, that that altar was, uh, even some argue on Mount Moriah, that would be the place where Abraham and Isaac went, which we'll get to that later. Um, it would be the place where the temple gets built. It would be the place where Jesus was crucified. So some argue that, that Adam builds the first altar there. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know that there's definitely a sense that Cain and Abel are sacrificing because it's, you know, it's, it's obviously some kind of regular thing, and they would have got it from, from their dad. I mean, where else would it have come from? And it's likely that Adam was sacrificing in response to God's sacrifice on their behalf. Remember, God killed an animal to give them skin or whatever, so or cover, I mean, so that would be likely. But he notes that Adam brought the fat, or excuse me, Abel brought the fat and stuff to the... you got to remember, Moses is writing this years later. So to the people who are reading this from Moses' day, they would have recognized that meant a burnt offering because that's what they did. They would have a burnt offering. God told them to do it, and it comes in Exodus. And they would have a burnt offering, and they would bring the fat of the animal and put it on there. So the fat, fact that Abel is doing that, as Moses is telling us, Moses is telling them that this sacrifice would have been a burnt offering of some kind uh, that, they were, that they, these two were doing. So why was Abel's accepted and Cain's rejected? Um, there's a lot of, well, uh, there's a fair amount of debate about that. People like to get into uh, theological arguments about it at times. I don't think it's that confusing, but some say it's because it was supposed to be a blood sacrifice, that God had killed animal to put on the clothes, to make, give the skins for clothes for Adam and Eve, and so that meant from therefore it was supposed to be blood. And sure enough, later on down the road, there's definitely the, sin, the, the call for blood sacrifices from God, um, and they say, well, Cain didn't bring a blood sacrifice. Abel did, but Cain brought you know, wheat or fruit of the ground, it says, whatever that is. But if you want to be fair about it, there is not anywhere yet that God has said you have to bring blood, for one. Uh, for two, they did have to bring fruit of the ground as well later on. So there were multiple sacrifices. They weren't all just blood. Some of them they were supposed to bring uh, harvest items to be sacrificed. And then probably the biggest argument here for me kind of against that idea is that both of these boys, what did they do? It told you what Abel did. What did he do? It's in your Bible. Shepherd, right? And it tells you what Cain did. He worked the ground. So one of them took care of animals. One of them worked the ground. The one who took care of animals brought an animal. So naturally, the one who works the ground, it would make sense, would bring what works the ground. So I don't think that is exactly what it was. So what was it? Well, first look back at the Bible. Don't always look back down. It says in there that the offering is tied to the person. Did you, did you catch that? It says God had regard for Abel and his offering. And God did not have regard for Cain and his offering. It's not just like God looked at the offering and said, you know, uh, okay, that one's good, and uh, no, that one's not so good. Or he inspected the animal, you know, it's not like that. 
So what's he looking at then? That's what's up, man, looking at that heart. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, you can just make a note of it in the New Testament. The author of Hebrews wrote this. He said, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So here's our answer. Through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So what makes a good offering, an accept, a good and acceptable offering? Based on Hebrews, faith, right? Faith, that's what it says. It's the heart that makes the offering. So God's not looking down at the money on the table and going, wow, man, that's that's a lot of money, man. You, you busted your tail on that one or you took a hit there. You know, God's not looking at that. So this is, should be good and, and frightening at the same time. You know, it, it means you don't have to necessarily give every single thing you have and go live on the street. But it also means he's looking. So if, if there's more you have to give than what you're doing and he knows it, it's the heart. It's not about the number. It's not about the amount. Uh, Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 God speaking through the prophet, he says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. Or grace is a good word there, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So he's literally saying that. I mean, I commanded you to bring the offerings. I commanded you to bring the sacrifices. But I'm telling you, that's not what I want. What does God want a burning animal for? Let's be honest. You know, it's not, he doesn't, it's not about that, Right? That's where the often misquoted cattle on a thousand hills things come from. God saying, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your busted up cattle. I own them all, is what he's saying. So anyway, I know, again, it's easy for us to jump in here and say, yeah, but well, I would never commit murder. And that, again, it might be true. But remember, the issue here is the heart before the act. It is the heart before the act, the anger inside that's getting provoked probably from level to level. And we don't know what was going on, but he didn't decide this yesterday. So from level to level, this anger getting provoked until you completely lose control. I think Jesus had this in mind in Matthew chapter 5. I think maybe he was thinking about these boys when he was preaching. Uh, and in verse 21, he says this, You've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to a judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. I'm not breaking all this down right now. I just want you to see. Verse 23 says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So again, he doesn't need your timely gift. He needs you to have what? The right heart. You know, I know there's a lot in that text right there, but I'm just, I want you to see. I think he's even thinking about Cain and Abel. But he's saying, hey, leave it at the altar, go get your heart right, and then come back and give it. Because he doesn't want the gift, he wants the heart that's going to give the gift, right? Verse 6, back in Genesis chapter 4. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face falling? What are you looking down for, bro? Verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So Cain's face has fallen. He's looking down. He's, he's not sad. He's furious. Biting his teeth mad. At who? Huh? God. Yeah. Not at, not at his brother. At God, I mean, he's mad at his brother too, clearly, but he's mad at God in this moment. Furious at God. So mad he's not even, he won't even look up at him for whatever that means, however that worked, you know, whether he's looking at the sky or there's an actual appearance of God there. Either way, he won't look up. God says, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Now, this is huge. He's not talking about salvation by works. That's not, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying if you do enough good things, uh, I will approve of those things. Because we already know it's not about what he gives anyway, right? It's about the condition of his heart. So what he's talking about here is a pattern of life that is well. If you live a pattern of life that is well, you're on one side. 
But there's another side. There's no neutrality is what he's getting at here. If you don't actively seek to honor God, you don't actively live a life of doing well. If not, then sin is waiting for you. Like waiting for you to pounce. It's a sense of you can't be neutral. One of the things that uh, I realized after I got out of the drug world is I can never be neutral. I can never just go home, raise a family, go to church on Sunday, and then do my thing throughout the week because I'll be right back on drugs, like in a second. Uh, I realized that for me, I have to. Fight. it has to be a battle for me. Not, not a personal battle like, oh, keep it away, keep it away. But I've got to dedicate my life to the Lord, to serving the Lord, to, to battling that disease of drug abuse and other people, to helping other people, however you want to look at it, I, I realize I can't just go sit down. I can't do it. Because if I do, it's crouching. And y'all all know, whether it's drugs or whatever it is in your life, you know what it is. Don't be alone with that computer. Well, why not? It's just a machine, right? You know, just a machine. For some of us, it's easier to harbor anger, though. We feel like maybe, you know, I, it's not worth blowing up over. It's not worth getting mad over. But you're also, maybe it is worth getting mad. Maybe it is worth solving the problem. But rather than cause a problem or deal with it, you just sit on it. And then what happens? It gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and it swells and it gets worse and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds until suddenly she didn't put the fork in the right spot and it's explosion. You know what I mean? Now, now I'm, I'm mad about 10 years ago and I'm about to let you have it. You know what I mean? And then if she comes, I'm just using this as an example. I'm not, I don't have one specifically in mind. She's over here smiling at me. Uh, but... And then, it, and then if she comes back out of anger, then your anger goes to another whole level. What does it take to get it back down? It, it, nothing's looking at getting it down. You're just looking at unloading it, and anything that fuels it makes the fire burn higher. You know, that's, that's kind of the idea of what he's talking about here, that rather than living well by seeking to honor God, hey, all you got to do is not do that. He didn't say, hey, go out and start, you know, have a sip every now and then, turn on the computer. He didn't say any of that. He said, all you got to do is not live a life that honors God, not do well, and it's waiting on you. Like, it's waiting on you. And it would appear that Cain was harboring anger at his brother. That's highly likely. But did you see that it's God that set Cain off? It's God that, that set him off. Think about what God's saying here. It's, it's not that sin is going to surprise you. It's not that sin is, oops, walk along, stumble, and fell into sin. He's saying, God's telling him up front, it's crouching at your door. It's going to pounce. It's going to overwhelm you. And God's telling him right up front that that's the case. It's not like it's potentially dangerous. It's a monster, a snarling monster that wants to leap on you, dominate you, control you, and then leave you dead. Busted up and dead. It's crouched. Y'all all know what that means. What is an animal that's crouched doing? Only one thing. Preparing to leap. You know, the teeth, eyes, drool. Picture it however you want to picture it. That, that's what's being talked about here, waiting for you to do one thing, crack that door. Crack that door. But that big old if in there is a beautiful thing. Can't pounce if you don't open the door. So there's a big starter. Keep the door shut. You know, keep the door shut. If is a great word because it implies there's a choice here. You can rule over it. Or you can be mastered by it. If sin wasn't a temptation, guys, if sin wasn't a temptation for us, we wouldn't have to rule over anything. Just ignore it and walk away, right? We just ignore it and let it go do its thing. But it's not that way. So we have to be actively taking a position of saying, no, I will not. No, I'm not going to. There's a pattern of life that leads to victory over sin. 
And there's one that allows it to crouch at your door, expecting you to open the door. Expecting you to open the door. And Cain throws it open, and out of anger, sin pounces on him and takes him all the way to murder. All the way to murder. Look at verse uh, 8 here. It says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. That means he's setting him up. It's a plot. So he's setting him up here. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up. So he gets him out in the field and he rises up. That means he takes an offense. Coaches, you know what we're talking about here. He lines his offense up. He's made a strategy. He puts his offense on the field and attacks against his brother Abel and killed him. You may have heard it said before, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost more than you want to pay. And that is crystal clear right here. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? First, this is cool because this is just like Adam and Eve. Remember when they ate the fruit, God came to them and asked well, who told them they were naked? Why are they, where are they? God comes to, even in this moment, God comes to Cain and in essence gives him a shot at owning it. Ask him a straight question. Any chance God didn't know where Abel was? Know what I mean? Obviously not. So he's asking him, where's Abel? What have you done? Uh, but unlike his parents, a Abel's response is to lie and mock God. Like, wow. Like, I mean, straight mock him. You know, Paul made mention to something like that in Galatians 6, 7. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever one reaps, what? He sows, right? Uh, God's not, you can't, you're not going to mock him out and make fun of him. He knows what you did. He knows what you did. But we do it, don't we? We, we can do this. It's easier than you think it is. It comes with getting real casual with God. And we should be, okay? We should be. Uh, but when you start going to the point of Jesus is my homeboy t-shirts and stuff, you're starting to maybe push it a little bit. You know what I mean? There, there's some line in the sand where we go from Jesus is my friend to Jesus is a punk or whoever I want him to be. You know what I mean? And that's not the case either. It's real easy, especially in our world nowadays, to slip over into that place where we make it so casual that all of a sudden it really is not holy anymore. And it's real easy to make fun of things that aren't holy because the, the opposite of holy is common. So why not make fun of those things? Or it's other little things, like we just say no to him on certain things. Like, no, I'm not going to church. No, I'm, you know, I'm not going to spend that time in the Word this morning. No, I'm not wasting time praying today. Uh, it's not a waste. I don't mean to say it's a waste, but I, I don't have time for it. I'm not doing it. Uh, I'm not sharing my faith. I'm not my brother's keeper. I mean, you, you walk right into it before you realize it, you know, and you're, and you're saying the same thing. It's not my problem, God. I, 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 look, I, I mean, we're cool and all, but I don't have time for that today, God. I, and I much less don't have time to care about how anybody else feels today. Now, I know you're not committing murder, but you're basically mocking him in a sense of saying, I don't have time. I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm not my own keeper, much less my brother's keeper. Don't put that responsibility on me, God. Verse 10, and the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. This is a great statement right here. The epicness of man's depravity, by the way, that the first recorded sin is not anger, it's not hatred, it's not adultery, it's not harsh language, it's murder A after the fall, after the fall. So we go from eating the fruit to murder. Now, there were likely other things in there, but the first ones we have recorded are eating the fruit all the way to murder, brother against brother murder, like, but the story here is about God, not about man. Remember that. We're following the story of God, not about man. This is not about Cain. This is not about all of that. This is a, we're following the story of God. Like, what, God, where, what are you painting here? Abel is a picture of the promise that's to come in Jesus. He's a shepherd. Catch that? Just little similarities. But he's a shepherd whose offering was excellent and acceptable to God. Whose offering 
God turned his eyes towards. In Luke chapter 11, you don't have to turn to it, but Jesus refers to Abel as a prophet. Refers to him as the original prophet. And Abel's blood pointed to Christ's blood. Hebrews, again, explains it this way. In Hebrews 12, verse 24, the author says, We have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What's Abel's blood speaking or calling out for? What do you think his blood is calling out for? Justice. justice. Exactly. Abel's blood is calling out for justice. What did Jesus' blood call out for? Forgive them. Literally said it on the cross. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus' blood calls out for forgiveness. Now, the amazing thing about God is he accomplished both of those on the cross. Through Christ, he accomplished justice and forgiveness on the same cross. Look back at verse 11, chapter 4. We'll finish up here. And now you're cursed from the ground, God says to Cain, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother from your own hand. So the ground that he works now has become cursed uh, because he put his brother in it, basically. Verse 12, when you, you work the ground, so the curse on Adam was something that was handed down all the way through, so he would have already inherited that, but in some ways, perhaps because of his offerings in the past or whatever, God had been blessing his work, but now he's saying it's fixing to get worse for you, bro. When you work the ground that now holds your brother, it shall no longer yield to you, is strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So because you can't get anything out of the ground, you're going to look for places where you can. It's going to drive you now away from Eden even farther. It's going to drive you away from your family. Um, look what Cain says to the Lord. My punishment's greater than I can bear. That's not fair. Translation. Dave translation. Verse 14. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground. And from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Well, who's going to find him? People say, well, there's only four people on earth. Not so. Adam and Eve continued to have kids. And they continued to spread. So this actually makes good sense. Because why would random strangers want to kill Cain? They wouldn't. But why would family want to kill Cain? Because he killed their family. They're going to know you killed our brother. You know, it doesn't say that, that he went off to Las Vegas or he went to Phoenix or he went to New York City with 500 million people. He's just saying that people could be 20 of them, could be 200 of them, however many people on the earth will look to kill me. Why? Because they're, they're family. Verse 15, then the Lord said to him, nope, not so, my translation says. I have written in there, not a chance, because that's the way I think he's saying it. Not a chance. I'm not going to kill you. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Now, this is another one of those things that gets wrestled with a little bit. But first, notice that Cain is more worried about his own punishment than his relationship with God. See that? Or how he's hurt his family. Even now, he's only worried about his own well-being. No, like, ooh, I messed this up, God. So God's take on his heart was pretty accurate, wasn't it? Um, some see this mark as an act of grace, like a last-minute act of grace that God is keeping people from killing him by placing this mark on him. Others, uh, like myself, see this more as a curse, that he's marked in such a way that, no, you're not going to get out of it that easy. You know, I, I've, you guys who know me know I've done prison ministry for more than 20 years. And in fact, was that you and I were talking, somebody were just talking about this. If you got life in prison, like how in the world would you endure that? Just thinking about that, like you're, you're fixing to do your entire, no, you'll never get out of this place again, ever. I promise you, all of them entertain the thought of suicide and a lot of them go through with it, you know? So I I think to some degree, this is just my take on it, and there's arguments for both sides, but I think I lean more towards that way. God is saying, you're not getting out of it that easy. Not getting out of it that easy. And 
Some even go as far, and this is only an idea or a thought, but some even go as far as to suggest that the mark might have been like leprosy or something. Because at this point in time, there are no diseases that we would know of anyway. There was nothing like that on the earth. And so maybe this is a place where he puts a mark on him. Like if you've ever seen leprosy, it's a frightening, disgusting disease where deformity happens. It's extremely contagious. Uh, and ultimately, it ends in death, which is just like sin, deforming, uh, contagious, and it ends in death. Now, that's just a thought. That, nothing about that's in the Bible, so don't go say, hey, the Bible says it was leprosy. That's not the case. Uh, but he marks him with something. Verse 16, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So he goes, they were already kicked out of Eden to the east. He goes farther east away. So remember, though, we're following the seed. So what's Eve got to be thinking at this point in time? Um, Cain says here that God's driving him away. But is that what Cain left? Is that Cain turned away from the face of the Lord? I mean, he turned away. He left and he's snapping at God for his punishment. He never admits his sin. Uh, King David later, we'll talk about him too, but later on he makes some epic mistakes He uh, has an act of adultery that leads to murder, and he betrays and kills the best friend who's like a brother to him. But his response is way different. Psalm 51, verse 1. This is how David responds when he gets confronted by God with it. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love or grace. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from... Iniquity cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. It's all in my face. I can't see anything else. And against you and you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. You're right to judge me. You're right for what you say. I've sinned against you and you only. I know I hurt these people, but you're the one I sinned against. In verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not from your presence. It's almost the opposite. Maybe even again, maybe he's thinking about Cain. No, what I've done is horrific. Please don't send me away. Uh, The heart is the difference. David and Cain, in essence, did the same thing. Could argue David did worse than Cain. Uh, But the heart is different. One is facing the Lord and repenting. The other is going away from the face of the Lord and unrepentant, choosing rebellion instead. Hey, it's better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. You know, that's the attitude of Cain as he goes. And then you have this lineage that follows. We're not going to go through all of you. You can look at it at your own time. But you see sin and self-accomplishment being celebrated. Sin and self-accomplishment being celebrated over and over again. And they're facing the same thing Adam and Eve faced in the garden. Adam and Eve were put, put with a choice. Believe, believe God, abandon sin, build God's kingdom. Believe God, abandon sin, and build God's kingdom. Instead, it's believe the devil, abandon God, and build your own kingdom. And that is the lineage that is following straight on. Verse 25, quickly it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring or another seed instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So she knows she's lost Cain. She knows she's lost Abel. And now she's saying, God's given me another seed. Now, she had other kids. So, you know, is this number three straight in a row? Maybe. But either way, she's identifying this kid as the offspring, the seed. In fact, um, when she says appointed for me, God has appointed, that's changed. It's not with God's help now. It's God appointed for me. So you see a little bit of even her heart that's changed maybe a little bit. And she's seeing this as this prophecy from Genesis 3.15 of these two seeds, the seed of woman continuing. And again, it'll go throughout all the scripture. We'll follow it um, as we go. One other thing to note, look at chapter 5. Just look at verse 1. I'm not unpacking this. I just want you to see it. Verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, so this is summing it up before it goes on, he made him in the likeness of God. Now, we've already studied all that. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man or Adam when they were created. Okay? Now, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son, look at this, in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. 
So things have changed a little bit, right? When we get to the flood, you'll see that God still says we're created in his image. But it's a mixture now. It's created in God's image, but in the image of your dad. In the image of your fallen, sinful, earthly father. And that's the case with Seth here. He's created in the image of Adam, his dad. In verse 4, the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. How many do you think he could have in 800 years? Just saying, you know. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died, 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 and he died. And you can keep reading. I'm not being hard. I'm just saying that is. Sticking true to God's word, in chapter 5, there's, and he died multiple times. And he died, and he died, and he died. We tend to read stories like this. Uh, honestly, if, if I'm honest about it, we tend to read stories like this, and we want to put ourselves, any, any story in the Bible, we want to put ourselves in the story somewhere. And so we all want to be able. You know, we all want to be the good kid. Nobody wants to be the bad kid. But the fact is, if we are in this story, without question, we're Cain. Christ is... Abel. He's the shepherd that was slain. We're the sinner that causes death. Jesus is the good shepherd. He does the opposite of Cain. Rather than kill his brother, he dies for him. And his blood cries out to God for mercy. Father, forgive them. Just as the first death here was the son of Adam, it would be the son of God whose death would break the curse on Adam and the sons of Adam. Jesus, listen, Cain gets a mark. Jesus gives a mark. The mark on Cain, don't know what it was, but I know the mark on us is the cross. You know? And I'm not saying anything funny by that. I'm just saying, rather than a curse on us, the cross is on us. So what do we do with this? Well, really quick, I'd just say, how you doing? Are you doing well? That sounds a funny statement, but I'm being serious. Are you doing well? Are you doing well? Ask yourself, how do I honestly feel about sin? Real simple question. Ask yourself, how do I honestly feel about sin? Ask yourself, how important is God to me? Okay, two questions. How do I feel about sin? How important is God to me? Now, before you just answer that, how much of what you do reflects your answer? Whatever your answer is to those two questions, how much of what you do reflects that answer? You could say what you want to say, but how much reflects that answer? One of my favorite lines is, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. I, I pop that in my head all the time. It doesn't make me perfect by any means, but it's a great line. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So this is a bit of a heavy story today because of the topic, but the picture of Christ in it is clear. You know, And if you don't know him today, hey, that's where all this starts for you. That's where all of this begins for you, is in recognizing that anger and um, sin in our own lives, man, it's like, maybe it feels like that to you. Maybe it feels like a monster on top of you, a monster on top of your back, something that you can't escape, something you can't get off of. But it's the innocent blood of Christ that offers forgiveness it's the innocent blood of Christ that takes the judgment for that sin and for that murder, for that anger, for whatever it is, uh, and bears it on his cross. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray today that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that hadn't given their life to you, God, I pray that they do it today. However they want to say it, Lord, that they do it today. They admit that they're a sinner. They, I mean, it takes... Honestly, it doesn't take a lot to do that. Lord, I know I'm a failure. I know I've messed up. I know I'm not perfect. Lord, I pray that they would do that, that they would trust in who you are, that you are who you say you are, that whether we can explain it or not in every little detail, we can trust that you did come. You did uh, live. You did die on a cross. You were raised from the dead for our sins, conquering an enemy we could never cross, conquer, Lord to give us hope. I, I know that though we can't explain it, we can trust it. And I pray that people would do that today and that they would believe in what you've done in that it is enough, that nothing that I can do will ever be enough, but what you did is. Pray that people would confess that to you today, Lord. I love you. I thank you for the privilege of being in your word. And God, 
now as we sing another song and, and, and take a few minutes to let it sink in and to, and to wrestle with it for just a few minutes before we go, God, help us be able to pull your word into our hearts and carry it with us throughout the week. The beautiful thing is we have it in our hand. So, so let us use it in ways that help us and also help us care for our brother. And we ask these things for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.